Welcome to The Big Rich Show. This podcast will focus on conversations with friends and acquaintances within the four-wheel drive industry. Many of the people that I will be interviewing, you may know the name, you may know some of the history, but let's get in depth with these people and find out what truly makes them a four-wheel drive enthusiast. So now's the time to sit back, grab a cold one, and enjoy our conversation. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two, Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Why should you read Four Low Magazine? Because Four Low Magazine is about your lifestyle, the four-wheel drive adventure lifestyle that we all enjoy. Rock crawling, trail riding, event coverage, vehicle builds, and do-it-yourself tech all in a beautifully presented package. You won't find Four Low on the newsstand rack, so subscribe today and have it delivered to you. On today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, we have Vern Simons. Vern is, well, he's been in the magazine industry for a little over 20 years. Vern will be the first guest on the show that I have not known or had lengthy conversations with beforehand. We just talked a little bit about five minutes or so here on the phone before we got started with the interview. But Vern, thank you for coming on board and sharing your life history with us. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm very honored to uh, be able to come on here. I feel like I kind of invited myself on, but I hopefully I have some. I, I listening to your podcast. There's a lot of parallels between my life and a lot of things that are very different uh, with a lot of the other people that you've talked to, and I just find it fascinating to get to hear people's backstories, just because we we're all kind of married as it were through this love of going off road but uh we all have different experiences and it's really fun and interesting to learn about different people including yourself which i i don't know i mean like you like we said before we've both been in this about well i we've both been four-wheeling longer than we've been in the industry but Correct. we've both been in it for for about 20 years and somehow we've uh missed each other and that happens every now and again. Like I think a few years ago, I met Eric Falar for the first time and, and uh, I was with my buddy Trent McGee and we were like, man, how, how is it that we didn't know this guy? It was just bizarre. But <laughs> He's one of those guys works, that once you meet him, you know, it, it's like a, almost like an STD, you know, he, it's really hard to get rid of once you, <laughs> once you've met Eric. <laughs> that's, 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 fairly accurate <laughs> but he'll enjoy that reference <laughs> yes yes he will yes yeah he will so let's That's jump funny. right into the meat and potatoes of it um i know that you have listed that durham north carolina was home is that where you were born as well well so i was actually born in new haven connecticut well um, that's a little we, ways away from durham yeah <laughs> so uh sort of my backstory is very tied in with my my parents and who they were, they're both, they were both, uh, academics. My mom's a biologist and my dad is a anthropologist or a paleontologist. So anthropologists are the people that study human humans and paleontologists are the people that study fossil animals, extinct animals. Right. And, uh, so they're both academics. Um, I kind of like to poke fun of myself and say I'm the black sheep of the family. Um, they both, you know, were very accomplished in academic academia. I did okay in school and, uh, uh, I have some accolades or some higher degrees, but nothing quite like they do. They both made careers out of science and it was a really interesting, uh, it was really interesting to grow up with them as my parents. They were good parents, uh, great parents, but, uh, just the, all the things that I got to do are really unique and, Honestly, I was kind of excited to come on here and talk about that because I don't think a lot of people have heard some of the crazy stories that what uh, are part of my life, well, which even I don't believe sometimes. So. Let's let's <laughs> go right into that. I, you know, it, 
when you said that your parents were in in the sciences, biological, um, anthropology, and um, paleontology, I I that under that made me understand better your background, um, where your schooling is at, and what you did. Because I was going to yeah. go, how did you get from right. biological anthropology at Duke to being a writer for you know, the enthusiast network or whatever the myriad of names that, yeah, have, right. that have, yeah. have owned the companies. Um, yeah. Well now, now we're motor trend, which I think people are like excited to hear that, but they're also confused cause it's not, I don't work for motor trend magazine, but I work for four wheeler magazine. Right. But yeah, I guess we're, we're getting kind of out of a out out of of sequence, but that's okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> so my dad worked at Yale uh, which is in uh, New Haven, right, Connecticut, and that's where I was born. And uh, pretty shortly, I was born in 1976, and in 1977, he got a job at uh, Duke University, which is in Durham, North Carolina, which is almost the geometric center of North Carolina, or real close to it. And uh, it was a great place to grow up. And when people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from North Carolina because I don't, I have no memory of uh, that first year. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, I, I feel like I'm Southern. Um, I, when I talk to my friends that I grew up, I, I get a little bit of a Southern draw. I've lived all over the place. So it's sort of gone away. But uh, I think it, there's maybe some of it still at all times, but who knows? Everybody picks it up occasionally with certain phrases or words. You know, you'll you'll right. go back into you know that that accent that was your that you heard all the time as you were growing up. I like to yep. say that the sweeter the tea, the deeper the accent, and slower the speech pattern. That's right. Yeah, and it all has to do yeah. with the humidity and where you grew up. That's right. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I like that. I like sweet tea. I don't drink any or drink it much anymore, just because uh, I don't need the calories. <laughs> <laughs> but usually, Amen. when I get talking to my my uh, buddies from high school or whatever, I'll I'll come back and I'll my wife's like, "Who are you talking to?" She's like, "What do you mean? I don't. I don't. What? What? <laughs> talking to my buddy Nelson from North Carolina." <laughs> I'm laying it on a bit thick, but you know, I don't know. Well, I like being not. from the South. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I grew up in Durham, which was a great place to grow up. And I grew up in this uh, kind of weird family with uh, my parents were really social. And uh, my dad was a very amazing guy. He uh, had lots of students and there were constantly students around and he liked to party. So there were constantly parties. Um, and, uh, it was, yeah, it was just a really interesting, uh, place to grow up. And then he was constantly traveling. He did field work in, uh, Wyoming. Um, and he drug us along to Wyoming a bunch of times. And then he also had, uh, established a field program, in Egypt, uh, in the Sahara, uh, in Northern Egypt, uh, not too far from where the pyramids are. And he'd been working out there, I, I believe since the sixties, wow. um, collecting fossils out there. So he drug us along to, uh, and I say drug, like we didn't want to go, but we went to, we went willingly. The whole family went out to this field locality, which was in the Sahara desert. And so I stayed in a Bedouin tent as a kid in the middle of the desert. And during the day, we'd go and look for fossils. And I'm thinking you can probably imagine that that involved four-wheeling, even though that was not the main reason to be out there. Right. Toyotas and, and Land also, Rovers? Yeah, lots of... Uh, so he, there were two... Or no, there was one Toyota uh, FJ55 that he'd actually bought in the States and shipped over to Egypt. And then there were a couple of uh, FJ45, so the, the pickup trucks. Right. And those, I love those trucks, but I mean, they're pretty rare in the U.S. Um, otherwise, I'd probably own a passel of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, a, it was sort of a 
charmed and amazing childhood because I got to, I mean, I was, I think I was eight years old the first time I was in Egypt. Nice. And uh, like I said, we were staying in a tent in the desert and it was uh, it's sort of surreal to think about. Like, I, you know, it's not something that's a, that a lot of other people have experienced. And we did it for uh, usually about a month at a time. He was, he was over there sometimes for two months. Um, but usually, or when we went, we weren't there quite that long. I mean, it was kind of tough. You're, you get really dirty. And my mom wasn't, uh, ecstatic about, uh, not getting to bathe for multiple weeks at a time (laughs) (laughs) as a, as a eight year old or a nine year old, I'm pretty sure I didn't care. (laughs) I would imagine not. (laughs) But it yeah, preps you so, for life now on the trail. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. People are like, you know about camping? And it's like, yeah, I got, I got that. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> and he also uh, did field work in Madagascar. So oh, nice. Madagascar is a, a really interesting island. Uh, biologically, it's fascinating. Like we all know it, or well, most Americans know it because of the movie Madagascar and all those cute little animals. And there are a bunch of cute little animals, but they're all relatively fascinating from a scientific standpoint. So uh, he was doing field work in Madagascar, and and, uh, we went there as a family the first time. And then subsequent to that, I went back with him uh, throughout high school and even into college, I would go with him, uh, and do field work in Madagascar and in Egypt, but I was in Madagascar probably more. And Madagascar was like, I mean, it was like living the safari life. Like we drive around the Island, which is about uh, a thousand miles long and 500 miles across. So it's a huge Island. Right. And it has all of these, uh, really interesting, micro environments um and i don't he he i think it was through his uh job at duke that he kind of got got uh started going to madagascar but the um he worked at the what was at the time called the duke primate center which is now called the lemur center which is one of the largest uh collections of uh living lemurs outside of madagascar and it's there in uh, the the uh pine forests of Durham, North Carolina. So, so when they, I wasn't in, do le- I got to ask this question. Do lemurs dance and do all that kind of stuff? Like uh, they show in the movie? <laughs> no, they don't. Sadly, lemurs are, lemurs are pretty lovable. Um, uh, they're cute. Uh, they're not terribly smart. Um, <laughs> I don't mean that as a, like, I love them dearly, but they're, they're just not really all that. They're just kind of, happy to sit up in trees and eat fruit and occasionally they get into squabbles they're they're kind of funny socially because uh almost all species of lemurs are female dominant oh so the the ladies are in charge and uh like they the ladies let the the boys know when they've gotten out of line they'll like if it's like um uh, if if one of the males does something wrong the the, the ladies will kind of give them a backhand and give them a whack in the face and they're like, they have to sit in the corner and look sad for a little while. So it it is kind of like being married in America. (laughs) (laughs) It could could be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happy wife, happy life. Yes, exactly. Credo. (laughs) And, and people, I joke. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I don't, I I haven't gotten backhanded, but I have gotten some pretty dirty looks from my wife. (laughs) (laughs) We all have gone through those phases. Trust me. (laughs) so that so it was a totally charmed life i mean i don't know i I can't express how bizarre it was at times and scary and fun but then when i was back in north carolina i was at least part of the time i was at this uh lemur center primate center and uh so it was kind of like growing up at a zoo you know there were animals all over the place and if one of them was sick or if one of them had a a baby and then sometimes the lemurs will have a baby and just don't want, like if it's a first time mother, they don't know what to do. They don't want to have anything to do with the baby. And then unfortunately you have to hand raise them, which isn't necessarily good for any of the animals, but it's kind of fun if you're a, a 
you know? Yeah. <laughs> you get to hold this really cute little critter and pet it and feed it and hopefully not ruin its life. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So hanging out in the primate center got you ready for your, your life in media. Right. <laughs> it may have. I don't, I, I'd never thought about that. But yeah, it prepared me for talking or interacting with lots of other primates, there if you, you will. <laughs> awesome. So, like I said, as I hinted at, this was all filled with driving around, and the roads in Madagascar are god awful as a rule. And uh, there aren't a lot of roads in the northern Sahara. So, we were constantly going four wheeling, and I like. I, as I may have hinted at my, it wasn't, my dad wasn't really, I think he liked four wheeling, but that of course was not the reason he was doing any of this. And he was, uh, surprisingly unmechanical. Like he, I don't even know if he could tell the difference between a Jeep and like a Toyota FJ 40. He'd just be like, ah, it's a, it's a field vehicle. That's what it was to him. Right. And, uh, he could drive. You needed to know how to drive. Um, my mom is German. Um, she has a whole other list of fascinating stories. She was a, a very young child at the tail end of World War II and had some pretty crazy stories. And uh, but she's she's much more mechanical. I don't know whether it's because she's you know because of that innate Germanness or whatever, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> So I was always fascinated and, and, and obsessed with cars and off-road cars, mostly, even as a kid. And she, I think she kind of was like, yeah, this is fun. She had had a, uh, she she grew up in, well, she, she lived a life in Europe before she came to the U.S. And she had like Vespas and little, the, you know, the little scooter Vespas. Right. And, uh, a, uh, she had lots of stories about a, an Austin Healy Sprite. Ooh. So the little, I, so I guess it's a little British sports car that she ran around Switzerland in this thing and had all kinds of adventures. So it was kind of funny cause my mom was the, uh, more mechanical individual in the family and kind of helped me when I started showing this interest in mechanics. That's awesome. So mom had the toolbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she was uh, definitely more mechanically inclined, and she really enjoyed driving. And like, so when I was learning how to drive, she she made sure that my myself and my sister knew how to drive manual transmissions, and she taught me how to double clutch when I'm downshifting. And there was definitely much more of a focus on things that are mechanical, which, which I was naturally drawn, drawn to for whatever reason. Um, I mean, my dad and I are very similar in many ways, but that was one thing that was very different. He was totally obsessed with all kinds of animals and knew all kinds of things about animals. And I just was like, there's pictures of me when I was, I could barely talk. And all I had was a, a Tonka truck in my hand and I was just, always obsessed with trucks nice. <laughs> and cars. <Yep. laughs> so, uh, like I said, we got to go four wheeling and when something went wrong, um, uh, you know, if something broke, I was always there with my head under the hood or underneath the car trying to figure out what was going on alongside of the other people that were there that, uh, knew a bit more about mechanical things. than my dad did, um, and when later on in, in that, you know, I would fix the, the cars. I think one morning in, we were in Egypt when I was probably in my teens and the, uh, those FJ four or fives wouldn't start. And I don't even know what I did, but I got them started somehow and kind of saved the day because yeah. <laughs> otherwise we were, otherwise we were just all stuck in camp. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I don't know. I kind of, it kind of was symbiotic because he was, he knew what we were doing out there and I was doing what I could to help make things work and awesome. doing as much driving as I could when I, even, even when I was maybe not licensed to be driving, but Hey, you don't get pulled over in the Sahara desert. 
for no. driving. You, and, you don't see anybody. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> if the guy's got his lights on and he's chasing you down, you know, you, you know for a long ways. <laughs> yeah, right. Hiding right. Behind a sand dune. <laughs> yeah. I think only one time we were out there and we came around a like a bluff and this guy popped out and it was like, whoa, where did this guy come from? And he was, uh, there were people who would go out there and uh, catch falcons for falconry. Okay. Um, I don't know. That's big in that sort of uh, Middle Eastern community, I guess. But yeah, it was fascinating to get to grow up and get to see all these places and get to see how different people lived and, you know, extreme poverty. And it always reminded me how lucky, even though Americans like to complain about things, we're, we're all incredibly lucky to be where we're at. True. And uh, I think that was very humbling as a kid and kind of helped make me, I don't know, more understanding towards people in all walks of life. My dad was also big into that. I mean, I think he would talk and listen to anybody who would talk to him. And he knew that you can learn things from anyone. I mean, people know, even, even if you're completely uneducated, there's probably something that you know better than almost anybody else on earth. <laughs> true. Very true. So, how so did, is that why you went to college for the things that you did then? Well, I was kind of a, uh, I was a lost soul. I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I know that feeling. It's kind of, it's kind of funny because it's like I ended up working at a car magazine. And when that, when I applied for my first job doing that, I was like, oh, yeah, this is totally obvious. Why didn't I think of it? Well, I didn't think of it until after I went through four years of college, like not knowing what to do with myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I would say I was kind of a an unguided missile, I guess, is what, what I like to say. I don't know that I'm dangerous like a missile, but I kind of like the analogy. Um, I just didn't know what to do with myself. So I kind of, I was like, maybe I should do what my dad d does or what my mom does. But I was also really social and kind of lazy. So I didn't really want to work too terribly hard at school. <laughs> so you <laughs> became terrible, a magazine but... editor and... <laughs> right, there right, you go. <laughs> right, 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 right. We do right. a magazine. That's not necessarily the case. <laughs> no, I, yeah, well, life, when your priorities change, your life changes, I found too. True. But, de but definitely when I was in college, I was, I was probably a little bit, you know, people age at different rates, and I was in, more immature than a lot of the other kids that were there. I don't think I totally wasted it. I, I didn't like, I, I, I did really well in high school and I, I got to, I was uh, admitted to Duke. So that's not an easy task. I mean, Duke's right. a hard school to get into. And I struggled, uh, especially the first year, just kind of because I came from a, a public school in North Carolina to Duke. I, I really had to turn it up in order to do well. And the first couple of years I struggled, but uh, I think, once I'd kind of gotten some of the social, I don't know, activities out of the way, I was able to focus more on schoolwork. Um, and so I did better in my, my last two years at Duke than I did at my first two years there for sure. <laughs> but it, the whole time I didn't know what to do with what I was doing. I was studying anthropology. Um, I took some geology classes that were really fascinating. Um, I actually decided when I was a second semester uh, junior that I would m minor in geology. And uh, I think if I would have found geology a bit earlier, I probably would have done more with that. And uh, I don't like my roommate was a mechanical engineer and I was fascinated by what he was doing. But I was like I said, I was just kind of lazy. I didn't want to like force myself to do all that math that I knew was <laughs> necessary to do mechanical engineering. So I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly not perfect and I certainly wasn't back then, but I had a lot of fun. <laughs> that's, uh, that's important training for the future. Yeah. I, I definitely learned a lot, especially uh, in the, in the magazine industry. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So 
so after college, I was still sort of lost. Uh, I actually worked for about, I think it was six or eight months. I went back to Madagascar and worked in a national park in Madagascar as wow. sort of a glorified tour guide. And I lived in a tent that t- whole time. Well, pretty much that whole time. And uh, that was a, a lot of fun, too. And I, like I was running around in the rainforest in Madagascar uh, helping people find lemurs and other animals. And I love animals. I mean, I'm kind of, I, I love off-roading too, but I don't do it because I want to go out and destroy stuff. I go out and I, I want to go out and see things. I want to go see places that I wouldn't want to walk to or <laughs> right. can't hike to. And, um, I'm always, enamored when i see an some sort of animal out on the trail so but that was another really fun experience um it didn't pay very well i think it was basically just uh it paid enough so that i didn't lose money but i didn't really make any money while doing that job but like i said it was fun i've kind of i'm selfish and want to do things that i enjoy now madagascar (laughs) does not have any large predators correct yes that is correct you're you're, you, you're that's very good yeah so that's when you're in of, a tent you're safe yeah you're pretty safe the, the the biggest uh carnivores there are probably the size of a large house a large dog not a large dog like a medium-sized dog i should say okay and they're uh they're fast they are also fascinating animals um, they're called the the Fusa or the Cryptoproctoferox is their uh, scientific name. Oh, you know, although easy that for you to say. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that could have changed in the past 25 years. But they're uh, they're pretty amazing animals. They they're they kind of look like a cross between a cat and a dog. They're kind of like a little panther and they'll run right up a tree and snatch a lemur out of the tree and uh, be quite happy eating a lemur. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so lemurs don't have a lot to worry about other than the, uh, the FUSA. Um, and yes, as a, uh, a kid from North Carolina in a tent, it's not all that dangerous. There are no venomous snakes that are known to science in Madagascar. Oh, interesting. Um, and, uh, I, I, I know a few people, like I know one, one, uh, person that I worked with subsequently who was bitten by something at her tent, like some, some carnivore ran up and like bit her finger as she was zipping up the tent and she had to get rabies shots, but that was sort of just mostly precautionary. Interesting. So the most dangerous things in, well, there are alligator, or I'm sorry, there are crocodiles in Madagascar, but uh, they're not too many of them. So usually the most dangerous uh, thing in Madagascar is riding in a car down the road and other people. <laughs> and because the roads are so bad and other people, yeah. Right, yeah. Other people are the ones that are dangerous. <laughs> typical. None of the animals are. Yeah, typical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 meant, I asked that because um, and my wife went to Zam- oh, Zambia. Yeah, Zambia. And Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other countries and did the safari type thing for a couple, three weeks. And the one of the people that she was with was so deathly afraid because they were sleeping in tents that, Uh you know, that something was going to come in the tent and eat her. And uh, so she had a flashlight with her the whole time and she would turn that flashlight on at any noise at all. And I probably didn't sleep much while she was in the tent. So. Right. Yeah. My mom had some stories like that. She did some field work in um, Kenya, I think it was. And she had a story that like one of the first nights she was there, she was in a tent and a lion came along, a male lion who was calling, came along and kind of laid down right next to her tent. And the lion's body like kind of pushed down the side of the tent that she was in. And, you know, so there's this whatever they weigh, you know, six or seven hundred pound hungry carnivore outside making some god-awful noises in the middle of the night 
but wow. for whatever reason, if you're if you're in a tent, a lion doesn't realize that you're edible, so they don't huh. mess with unless you like stand at the door and start throwing rocks at it or something. Yeah, I you're, think uh, I would be as quiet as possible and probably under the cot or bed or whatever, trying to right, yeah, figure, I'd, figure out how to get as small be, as possible. <laughs> soiling myself under the cot yes <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so then in uh that was kind of in 98 and 99 i think i was in uh madagascar as a glorified tour guide and uh it was great it was a good time no no complaints at all um not much four-wheeling because uh i didn't have any wheels to get around but that's okay <laughs> so you you go from from Madagascar in the late 90s, uh-huh. and then you get started in the magazine industry around 2000, so there's yeah. not a whole lot of gap between those. How did yeah, that so transition I, work? I came back from Madagascar, and I must have been in uh, like the tail end of 99, and uh, I, was, I moved back in with my parents because I didn't know what I was doing. I was in, you know... A pathetic lost soul living and, in the uh, basement <laughs> <laughs> right right and uh uh i was i'd always been obsessed with uh off-roading and and mostly looking at magazines i spent a lot of time looking at all of the magazines you know there was uh jp was one of them for sure peterson's four on off-road um what was it four-wheel drive and sport utility off-road four-wheeler of course i had all of those and i'd that's what I, 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 you know, we didn't have the internet. So when I wasn't doing school or something, I'd be sitting around and looking at magazines. And, um, finally, right after that trip, I picked one up and I think it was a editorial by, I think it was Cole Quinnell. And it said, so you think you want a job? And it was like, you, if you're comfortable eating gas station food and sleeping on the hood of a car or in the <laughs> desert and, and yada, yada. And I, and like, it was like a, a light bulb just absolutely exploded in my head. And I was like, this is a career. Like you could do that and they'll pay you. And I don't think I'm, I'm probably not much smarter than average, but I don't think I'm really that dumb. But for whatever reason, I just never even thought that that was something that could be a option option before that. So I responded to that editorial with, I sent in a resume of some sort. I don't even remember what it was. And uh, I didn't hear anything for a little while. And then I think, um, I think it might've been Rick Payway called me and I was like totally blown away because of course I knew who Rick Payway was. I was like, I knew who Rick Payway was and, and Tori Tellum, although I have to admit that I didn't realize that Tori Tellum was a lady until I met her. (laughs) Um, I, I, uh, I thought it was a guy named Tori, but uh, I knew who, you know, I'd heard the name Trent McGee and, and John Kappa and Christian Hazel and, Cole Quinnell, of course, and uh, David Freiberger, and these are all names that I'd recognize from bylines. And I remember talking to Rick and just being like kind of starstruck and not really knowing what was going on. Well, being an anthropologist, he he probably wanted you to do some background on him. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> right. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Rick. Rick. Rick and I have a lot of parallels because you know his dad was a geologist and he spent a lot of time doing field work with his dad i think growing up and so he and i have a lot of parallels like that my dad was a a geologist and a a biologist as much as anything so uh uh i don't know We, we hit it off over the phone and he was like i need you to send in some pictures or some uh photography and a writing sample and i was like okay so I think at the time I had a, uh, clearly I kind of came from a Toyota family mostly just because we've been doing stuff overseas and I hate to say it, uh, Jeep people, but Toyotas are global and there aren't a whole lot of Jeeps running around in Africa. And that's probably just because they weren't shipped there, but, uh, right. it's just the way it is. So, uh, uh, 
I actually owned a Jeep at the time. Um, I had a 97 Cherokee and, uh, so I just like took it out and flexed it out and took some pictures of it. And I don't know what I wrote, some kind of fake feature on it or something. I mean, there was nothing to write about on that car, but that's all I had sort of at hand. So it was a pretty good example for me in my brain, or that's what Rick told me to do. I don't remember exactly how it worked. And then I didn't hear from him for, I, it was like three weeks and I was like, well, that was kind of cool. I got to talk to Rick Pewe and, you know, it was interesting. What the hell should I do with myself? This is, I, I just figured it didn't pan out. You know, I wasn't one of the people that they wanted to continue with. And then I get a call. Um, oh, I guess the, uh, I went with my parents out to Wyoming, which is, as I mentioned earlier, that was another place that we did field work. Right. Um, so Wyoming's always been very, uh, has a big place in my heart. I should say Wyoming in the summertime because I've never really been there in the dead of winter and I hear it's awful. Well, you know, Wyoming um, is native American for the wind always blows. <laughs> I could believe that. <laughs> um, I, uh, so I, w I was out there. There was sort of a 4th of July celebration that some paleontologists in, uh, if you're a paleontologist and you've done field work in Wyoming, you've been to this 4th of July celebration. It's at, the, at a farm. It's called the Churchill Farm. It's uh, some people of, who lived in one of the valleys or the valley where Powell, Wyoming, which probably nobody knows where Powell is for a couple of hundred years. And somehow they got intertwined with paleontologists and have a 4th of July party that a bunch of paleontologists show up to every year. So uh, I think we'd gone out there for that. And of course we did some four wheeling. Uh, my dad was always good at kind of taking the road less traveled and we'd, I, I can't I can't recreate it, but we had a rental car that we picked up in Denver and and drove on back roads through um, part of Colorado and into Wyoming and then other back roads across Wyoming. He always liked to take the the two track or the back road as opposed to the highway if possible, unless we had to be somewhere in a hurry. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But uh, he knew that area like the back of his hand. So, I, like I said, I wish I could recreate some of those because they would be, you know, equivalent to overlanding nowadays. You know, I guess we didn't we didn't camp out necessarily because we'd flown in, but we ended it in towns where we could stay in a hotel. But uh, it was definitely lots of backcountry work and more exploration, which. It was one of the things that he and I definitely shared. We had, we would get four wheel fever, you know, where you want to see what's around the next corner and not be able to stop. So when I came back from Wyoming from that trip and uh, I think there was a letter or something like that, or I got a phone call and they were like, we want you to come out for an interview. And I was like, oh, great. I'd never been to Los Angeles. I got on a plane you know, stayed in some funny little hotel relatively close to the Wilshire Boulevard offices, which is where uh, that company, it was EMAP USA. I think it had just changed from being Peterson Publishing. Um, to EMAP? Yes. <laughs> I don't know what, oh, EMAP was a British company that had come in and bought it or bought part of it or something like that. And I don't remember what EMAP stands for. I probably should. But uh, uh, the interview was great. Like, I felt like it was like I interviewed with Cole Quinnell, I believe, and Rick Pewe and John Kappa. And it was like, I don't know, it was like hanging out with friends. I don't know. It was like, it was just felt great. Um, it wasn't scary or awkward or weird much like you would fear a uh, an interview to be when you're whatever i was 23 or 22 or whatever <laughs> right uh like i said that went really well flew back to north carolina again a week went by and i was like well i guess it didn't pan out and <laughs> that's apparently the story of my life i didn't like 
apparently didn't have the wherewithal to like call and pester them. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, all of a sudden I got a call from HR and it was like, how can you be here? Can you start? Uh, I think they wanted me to start like the next week. And I was like, uh, no, I can't do that. I live in North Carolina. <laughs> the commute's a bit of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need an extra day so I can pack and then drive there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'm pretty sure you can't drive from, <laughs> from North Carolina to Los Angeles in under like what, three days, even if you're really pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> so I was all in and, uh, I loaded up my, that same Cherokee and, uh, I had a dog at the time who was, he was my dog. And so he was coming with me and, I think my mom rode with me to kind of help share the driving duties and help me get settled when I got out there. And, uh, the next two years I lived in, uh, I lived in Westchester, uh, which is what near it's between, uh, Culver city and uh, what's that, uh, hunting, is it Huntington beat? No, uh, I've forgotten. It's been a while since I've been there. Forgive me. It's relatively close to, uh, where they're, the main offices now in in El Segundo. Um, and it was a cute little neighborhood at the time, but, uh, the Vern doesn't really get along with Los Angeles terribly well. (laughs) I felt, felt really claustrophobic in there. I'm not, I'm a really social guy, but I don't really like bars and like nightclubs and stuff like that. Right. That's not really my scene. So I was kind of, socially I just didn't do much when I lived in Los Angeles. And I think that probably was part of its doom for me. Um, I was, I was worked at JP magazine. I started at JP at that time, Rick had moved over from JP to be the editor of Peterson's four on off road. And, uh, they had interviewed and chosen three people one of them was myself, and then the other one was David Kennedy, who I think you may have heard of. He, he then later went on to be the editor of Diesel Power and kind of created that book. He's a fascinating guy, too. And then uh, a gal uh, from, I think, I think she was from Salt Lake City. She's from Utah, whose name uh, is Wendy Frazier, who worked for Peterson's for a couple of years. But we all got hired within like a few days of each other. Um, uh, David Kennedy started first, he got an office and, uh, I started, he started like on a Friday and I started the next Monday and I got a cubicle. And I remember like, that was always something that, that he was like, you know, always, <laughs> it was always uh, he was, he was, he's a good guy. He's a good friend of mine. I was just talking to him the other day, but it was like, I'll be in my office. And I was like, Oh, well I'll be in my cubicle. And I was like, <laughs> I, damn it. I had to, <laughs> he somehow got there faster than I did. But, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was sort of the, the, the heyday of, of, uh, you know, one of the times that could be seen as the heyday of magazine, you know, we had budget, we had, you know, there were lots of things going on. There were rock crawling events. There were, you know, you know, there were rock crawling competitions, I should say. And there were lots of, uh, you know, uh, enthusiast events that we would go to and, we did uh, new vehicle testing, which was great, um, and uh, I learned a lot. I mean, I, I, uh, the first article that I wrote was a feature on a uh, CJ3B, a high hood Willys um, from like the they're from the the fifties, um, and John Kappa had shot the feature, and he gave me the tech sheet and the pictures, and I wrote it. And, uh, I don't know. I was just kind of like, I was a pig in the pig pen. I was having a great time. Uh, other than the, the, the sort of lack of social life and, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, I was, Los Angeles is kind of a difficult place to live if you're not like the next Tom Cruise or think you're going to be the next Tom Cruise. I don't know if that's hard to (laughs) to explain, but I kind of think that's the truth. Like I had no plans, no interest in becoming the next Tom Cruise. I wanted to play with Jeeps (laughs) or trucks. (laughs) Yeah, that's not, uh, I get it. (laughs) And like the one, one or two times that I went to a nightclub or something, I got turned away at the door because I wasn't dressed 
well enough, you know, and I was like, I got cash in my pocket, you know, I was like, my money's green, but I wasn't fancy enough for, you know, the scene or whatever. So right. I was like, I, I don't need that in my life. <laughs> Heck, I got treated that way in Moab one time. Really? Yeah. Oh. The, the Moab Bistro, it's on the street behind oh. Zach's. Oh, yeah. The, the, my wife and I, we got off the trail. I don't remember where we were at, but we thought, well, let's, you know, let's go in here. We've never eaten there. And uh-huh. there was only like two or three cars in the parking lot. So we pulled in, walked in. And uh, as the lady walks up to us, she's, you know, like sizing us up. And I look and there is like nobody in the place. I can't, you know, I can see two tables that have two people each. Oh, at. my. And. She goes, yeah, it's going to be an hour and a half. You know, when she goes, do you have a reservations? And I'm like, no, do uh, I need one? Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, guess what? I suddenly don't want to eat here. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> thank you for making that choice for us because right. you're going to lose all of my friends now because I'm going to let yeah. everybody know. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about it on a podcast. I probably had more That's cash in my pocket than, than she made all year. You know, I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah. Damn yeah. Woman. Well, that's where I was at. I mean, it wasn't like, like I said, I was living by myself and yep. I wasn't rich, but I had plenty of money, but I apparently didn't have the right collared shirt on or something or yeah. I, whatever. The right logo it's on not, the pocket, you know. <laughs> right. It was not, not something that I was interested in participating in. <laughs> So I, uh, I was in Los Angeles for two years and I think it was, uh, Cole Quinnell and he was like, you know, when the, at some point the, the sort of Los Angeles rat race lifestyle is probably going to get to you. And he said, when it's not funny anymore, it's, it's probably time to leave. And that was about two years. <laughs> that's, about, <laughs> that's about what it took. And I feel like, uh, no, I know. Uh, so I was working for John Kappa and, uh, John's a friend of mine. He wasn't always the easiest person to work for, but uh, uh, he taught me a lot, and I and uh, I certainly it was all positive. And he at one point afterwards he was like, "You left because of me, didn't you?" And I was like, "No, it really didn't have anything to do with him, and it it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the job. It was the." trying to do the job from Los Angeles, which I still don't really understand how they think that's going to work. It's just such an expensive place. And if you need to go out and test off road tires, you got to drive two hours. And then of course you're in the fall hollow of off road, but still. Right. Um, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of work to like, now I live next to the desert. If I need a picture, you know, 15 minutes from now I can make it happen and and I think that a lot of people especially after the last year and a half that you don't need everybody's learned that you don't need to be in an office yeah yeah you know, it, unless you're doing retail sales you know right. you don't need to be in a building yeah yeah definitely so, uh, and I I mean I feel like the editorial jobs have been portable for a long time. I mean, I've been, I've been doing this for remotely for most of my career, but, uh, at the time I was just ready to get out of Los Angeles. See, I would have told Kappa. Yeah, you're the reason. (laughs) Well, I'll do that to him. He probably won't listen to the podcast, so I'll do that to him. (laughs) No. So I, uh, they also didn't give me a pay raise, which is really not, relevant other than the fact that i kind of used it as like a i was trying to use it as a leverage i was like you guys need to pay me more or i'm leaving and uh they said oh we'll give you here here's a a bonus we'll give you a bonus this year and i was like a bonus and like i said i didn't always make the world's best decisions but i knew that a bonus meant that i wasn't necessarily getting it next year and so i said no thank you (laughs) And, uh, I went back to school. I, I went back, uh, to North Carolina and tried to get myself into a graduate program again, thinking maybe I would become an academic. And, uh, I got connected with some people who were doing paleontological field work in, uh, Tanzania. Oh. And, uh, uh, 
I'd done field work with them in Madagascar and in Egypt on one of my dad's uh, expeditions. So uh, I was I was always pretty good at finding fossils and relatively good at identifying what the what they were and it's what I, it's like what I was raised doing, you know, I mean, I, like we didn't go to Disney world. We went out to Wyoming and collected fossils. So it was Much just better. sort of second nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in hindsight, yes. <laughs> At the time I wanted to go to Disney. World. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but Mickey. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. So I went back to I went back to school and I got uh, into the graduate program at uh, Ohio University. Um, and uh, I was doing field work in the summers in Tanzania, like I said, which was a lot of fun. I met my wife in graduate school. She's amazing. She's beautiful and she's a wonderful person. And uh, she now tolerates my behavior in the the uh, magazine world, which is, you know, I'm uh, well, I'll just put it this way. She makes a lot more money than I do. And uh, she allows me to do this job well, <laughs> instead of insisting that I go get a real job. You're in the magazine industry. <laughs> I think right. everybody knows that. <laughs> right, right. So I got the sugar mama out of the deal. And I also, uh, I found out that I didn't want to get a PhD in, uh, I was in a biology program and I just kind of was like, yeah, I just, I don't love this enough to put myself through this. So, uh, I was, I was in a, it was a program where, where I had started out in the master's program and, uh, had kind of decided that I would try to transition into the PhD program and then kind of was like, yeah, no, I'm just gonna, I'm going to take the master's degree and, and I go move on to whatever's next. So what so, was next? Uh, uh, well, so I, the, my wife, who we met, like I said, in graduate school there, I was there for, it was between 2003, that was 2003 to, I guess I left there in 2008. Okay. And uh, so I was in school for, I guess it was about three years, three or four years. And she was in a PhD program, so she needed she needed to be there for four years. And uh, the, so the last year that I was there, we'd already gotten married. We actually had a, we decided to elope. Her her sister had gotten married, and we just uh, went to a very small small wedding with her sister and all of her family. And uh, it was very small, like I said, but it was still stressful enough that we were like, ah, oh, we're just going to elope. We don't need to do anything like this. So, uh, we wanted to go somewhere out West, some sort of little mountain town. So to you took married. her to Wyoming, right? You know what? She, she was, she was looking around and she was like, there's this place in Colorado and it's like a ghost town and it's like the houses have been fixed up and you can stay in one of the houses. And then she was like, Oh, and then there's this Moab place. And you've talked about Moab. You've been to Moab. Right. And I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. Let's go to Moab. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go get married in Moab. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got on a plane and flew to, I think we flew right into Moab and uh, we were graduate students. So we didn't have much money. So I don't know how we afforded that. And it was uh December and we stayed at the Sorrel river ranch, which was, inexpensive because it's off season and we went into town and we got the uh like one of the photographers from i think it was called action shots okay they're like the guys that that are that are taking pictures of you and you're out there in your jeep on the trail right and i was just like yeah we just want to have some pictures we just eloped here and we're gonna get dressed up and you know you take some pictures of us and they're like okay 200 bucks and we're like okay great so we got like you know one of the guys that is used to taking doing what I do now, you know, taking pictures of off-road cars and, uh, uh, went to the town hall and got married by, I think it was mayor Dave at the time. I couldn't tell you what mayor Dave's last name was. <laughs> um, and, uh, a couple of the people who worked in the office were, our, uh, what's it called? A simple word that I just can't come up with. The courthouse. Yeah. Yeah. At the courthouse, just saying that, okay. that they were there for our wedding or whatever. Okay. And uh, so we were there for about a week. I think we rented a Jeep for a few days. And my wife determined that she does not like Hell's Revenge, 
which I'm still sad about, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just take your advice. Got out, yeah, right. I think we got out on it. It was a little bit icy, which I, is, uh, yeah. That's Hell's Revenge in the ice to, or snow is can be yes. very dicey. Yes, yeah. I do not blame her at all for, for thinking it was frightening. And she doesn't have to like everything I do, so that's that's okay. So what is what is she doing now with with her PhD? Well, yeah. So she uh, she was in the uh, roughly the same program. Uh, there was a uh, was that through a med- the medical school at Ohio University, which is an osteopathic medical school. So we both did a bunch of TAing in anatomy classes and learned a lot of anatomy. And she teaches anatomy at Midwestern University, which is here in uh, Glendale, Arizona. Okay. And uh, so we moved out here in 2008, I think it was, 2008 or nine, somewhere right in there. And uh, been here ever since. And about seven years ago, we had twins, which is a lot of fun, boy-girl twins. That are they'll be seven and they're Christmas babies. They're born December the twenty third. Oh, wow! So it's a uh, life's good. I don't know. I'm a kept man. I get to play with trucks, and I have these two kids that are a lot of fun. At this point, they may get become terrible later on. <laughs> so are you are you freelancing now or are you? Um... No, I'm I'm a uh, I'm full time staff. Uh, okay, I'm the tech editor for the Four Wheeler Network. Okay. For, one of the tech editors i think at one point they were they offered to change my name to senior editor and i was like i don't feel like i'm old enough to be the senior editor of anything <laughs> plus you get too big a title you're the first one on the block the, you know, <laughs> right. the cutting block yeah. <laughs> well let's see well, who's at the top okay we'll just get rid of them <laughs> i like the sound of tech editor better than i like the sound of senior editor right. maybe i'm a fool but but i, I the pay was the same, so what's the point in changing names? <laughs> when we bought Four Low and took it over and and started doing it, it's like, okay, what are we going to call ourselves? You know, <laughs> uh-huh. right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, luckily, because we don't have any employees, um, we don't uh-huh. have all those those people at the top on the, you know, when when you look at the the front page. Of the magazine, right, and yeah. you got yeah. all those people, and then you got the three guys at the bottom that are pre- creating content. We right. just have the yeah. content guys. <laughs> yeah, I have to. I have to be careful and watch what I say. But I no, think I that agree. I was listening to one one of your other podcasts, and I think it was a. Uh, I think it was the one with Fred, and I believe you hit it directly the, the the nail on the head, which is that I do not have an MBA, so I therefore cannot pretend to know how to run a large company. But it does seem to me like there's an awful lot of uh, the, the the business, at least it may be better now, but it certainly has been at times very, very top heavy. Yes. And uh, that seems to me to be one of the problems with uh, the magazine world. I agree. I'm, I agree. And like that's, that, that's why I don't, don't want to wax poetic no. too much for the fear of shooting myself in the foot. But. Right. But that's one of the reasons <laughs> that, you know, the smaller magazines like, like ours or crawl, um, yeah. you know, in, in our industry at least can still be successful is because right. we don't have all that overhead. Um, yep. you know, yeah. we can, we can do things a lot, we can do things a lot faster. Um, right. and, uh, you know, a lot leaner. So it's, it's kind of nice. Right. Yeah. I, I did do freelance for a while. Like when I was in graduate school and after I worked at JP for a couple of years, I did freelance and, uh, it was, it was good and I'm glad I did it, but it was, I was not, I wasn't on it hard enough to make that a career. Um, I'm not good enough at like keeping up with keeping after myself. I'm much better with, uh, getting a, a salary paycheck, even though it's not huge and, and having editors who stand over me and say, Hey, get your work done. Right. Which for me now is Christian Hazel. Who's a, like, I love him. He's like a brother. He and I work together. He was at four one off road when I was at, started at JP and he was sort of the, the last new guy before David Kennedy and Wendy and I started. So, uh, 
he he's always been really good to me and he's a great person to work for he's got a really good understanding of the life balance you know family life balance and work i mean like i love i love fred and like david freiberger they're amazing guys but they're they're a little bit too married to the job and it kind of makes it hard for anybody who uh, wants to have a family also right <laughs> that makes sense absolutely i don't mean that as a slight but if you work all the time for peanuts then it, then it's like the paradigm's been set and the rest of us have to do the same thing <laughs> <laughs> so so what is what is next what do you uh you know do you have any big aspirations without shooting yourself in the foot yeah no i mean i'm I don't mind talking about it. I, I don't know. I'm kind of riding this train as long as I can right now. Honestly, I'm kind of interested to see what happens. I feel like some things have gotten better over the past couple of years working at the, you know, working for the mothership as it were. Um, things are headed in the right direction. I mean, I feel like it's always been, even back in when I first started at the magazines, it was kind of tenuous. I feel like it's always been, kind of a tenuous position or job you know people don't seem to see the value for some reasons in what we do i think a lot of people do see the value in what we do but it's not i just i guess what i'm trying to say is it's really nothing new to be kind of in a position where it's like well is this going to keep going or not right. so i'm going to just keep riding the train for now and see what happens uh I, I think we've got some things, things, like I said, some things seem to be getting better. COVID was weird for everybody. Um, I feel like it was kind of a blessing for me because I work from home and my kids were home a lot more than they would have been if it hadn't happened. So I got to be with my kids a lot more. Maybe I'm just trying to, you know, see the sunny side of life, but. Um, There's nothing wrong with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it now for much of anything just because I feel like I got to be with these kids more than I would have otherwise. That's awesome. But it's been weird for the industry, right? I mean, it seems like manufacturers or pretty much all the manufacturers seem to be doing really well. I think it was hard. If they can on... get. Yeah. Right. The right. stuff that they if need. The supply to... chain. The supply stuff, chain you know... issues are crazy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was sort of amusing with uh, my my company that had sort of made this big deal about doing all these TV shows and web shows. All of a sudden, when COVID came along, those all that shut down because they couldn't film anything. And basically, the only thing that the company was producing was magazine articles. And I was like, huh, it's sort of interesting to me to see you know, to be able to say to these people that are higher up, look, we actually do have value. Look, we can, we can produce stuff during this pandemic and <laughs> right. <laughs> keep, keep this company somewhat relevant. If, even if we're not making as much money as these TV shows do. Um, I just, it, it was kind of like a, you know, a ha ha moment. Yeah. See, we do have some value. <laughs> yeah. That's just, <laughs> 2019 was the last year we did Dirt Riot. And so uh -huh. for a good nine years, we were doing 20 plus events a year and, uh -huh. you know, putting on races and rock crawls. And that uh -huh. that is really physically taxing. And we got to looking at it and said, you know, the, the numbers of the racers are going down, new racers. So our job at Dirt Riot was to train people we felt our job was to train people how to race, how to, how uh -huh. to be successful at the next level, which the next level was ultra four. Uh -huh. And we, I thought we did a really good job of that. When you'd look at results of, of King of the hammers and how many of our drivers that started with us would finish those races uh, compared right. to the guys that just went straight there, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so it was, we really felt we were doing our job right, but, as no new drivers were coming on after the others would step up to ultra four, you know, we looked at it from a business decision because I just physically couldn't keep up anymore once yeah, I got, you know, yeah. over 60 and it was like, all right, 
you know, how do I, how do we keep this going? Looked at the numbers and said, okay, we're going to just cut dirt riot. Well, right. you know, people were really disappointed to hear that. You know, a lot of our racers were like, you know, and even guys that had moved on were like, oh no, you're going to get rid of, you know, well, we had to. Right. Yeah. But we yeah. looked really smart doing it because, you know, come 2000, all of a sudden, just putting on our rock crawling schedule became, you know, such an ordeal. Oh, and yeah, yeah. It was, uh, we never would have gotten 21, 22 yeah. events in that year had it been, you know, had we'd still been doing Dirt Riot. Right, so, right. So then, then it would have been, the decision wouldn't have been made by you. It would have been made for you. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, I get that the, the paradigm's changing. I just think that at the end of the day, like magazines are, I mean, like I still can go back and look in my closet and pull out magazines that has information that you can't find on the internet. Correct. And even if you find it on the internet, you've got to weed through, well, does this person know what they're talking about? Or are they on here shit posting just to stir the pot, you know, where did they read it? Because they didn't right. actually do it. Yes. Right. Did they actually do it? Do they actually know how to TIG weld? Or are they just talking about it because they read something about it on some other forum? Yeah, slept <laughs> it's at like, a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> yeah. It's like you can't, like the the legitimacy of sort of the modern paradigm to me is just not, it doesn't have the depth. It doesn't have the, the it's not, it, it's like, the difference between, and I hate to say this because I really like Wikipedia, but it's kind of the difference between Wikipedia and an encyclopedia. Correct. You know, like you can, if the, <laughs> if the internet goes down, it, Wikipedia is useless. If you have one of these big old blue encyclopedias on the bookshelf, you can still, you know, confirm facts or, or <laughs> correct. <laughs> or, Something or, or that at has least actually come up with some data. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I, 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 like I said, I don't want to pick on Wikipedia because I like Wikipedia. I think it's fascinating and filled with good information. I mean, I'm sure there's some bunk in it, but uh, that's the way everything is now these days, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, but, uh, the other thing is off-road. I truly believe off-road is still about socializing. And oh, yeah. And it's, it's, you know, yeah, people may get some of, some of their information – from the internet, but off-roaders are hands-on people. Do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, even if they don't start off that way, they end yeah. up becoming well, that way. Right. I think that's the attraction. I mean, that's one of the major attractions to me is like you're, there's all this innovation and learning. Like, I mean, I hate to be a total nerd. I'm, I am a total nerd, but you're, like, I feel like this job's been wonderful because I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly learning about how things could be different or better or, you know, learning stuff about business that I never even wanted to know. Or, right. you know, if I get involved in trying to rebuild something, then I can go down a rabbit hole and dig out information from people who really know what they're doing when they're talking about, you know, building lightweight really strong axles with really high clearance or something like that like that to me is just the one of the major attractions of off-road i mean you there's so much innovation and you see it i mean it's like other motorsports you go out and the the cars have to be painted differently because otherwise you wouldn't know whose car was who you know like you go out to king of the hammers and people are trying very different things and it doesn't necessarily work all the time, but sometimes, you know, sometimes the solid axle car wins and sometimes the IFS car wins or independent suspension car work wins. Right. There's just so much of that. That's like, it's so freeing. Like you just, you don't, you can, you can have people tell you you're wrong and that doesn't mean you're wrong. You know, you, you, you have to go out and prove that you're not wrong maybe, but you may be on the right path. You just right. may not get far enough down the path and somebody right. else will yeah. pick it up, come in, you know, and be able to, right. to take it to the next level. And that, that happens a lot in off-road. 
right yeah mean? well and there's also a lot of uh there's a lot of individual even if people don't want to admit it there's a lot of like individual you know people competing with themselves you know because there's a lot of because we all can go out and one shot an obstacle and then two days later get out there and something slightly different or we you know forgot to lock a hub and sit there and bash and beat and get mad at ourselves and don't understand why it's not working kind of thing (laughs) there's a lot there's a lot of that in this like you know i mean there's a lot of individual learning and 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 screwing up and doing well and like sometimes i mean i i know i'm sure you've had it where sometimes you drive up something and you're like wow i didn't really think that was going to work that well (laughs) or just the opposite there was yes or you get on it and you flop and flail and you're like why on earth can i not drive up this (laughs) exactly at it uh wolf caves one time in mason texas we were i was getting Uh set up for one of our dirt right races and there was a a formation there that I had the guys racing up and I'd been up it in my Cherokee 30 times up and down. Right. And I got on it, slid off my line, smacked my head, even though my roll cage is all padded and an interior Mm -hmm. cage inside the, the Cherokee, I smacked my head on that and gave myself a slight whiplash. And Uh I was like, didn't knock myself out, but it was close. And I was like, how in the hell did that just happen? Right. You know, I mean, I'd never slipped off that line and it happened, you know, I just guess I wasn't paying a good enough attention or something, but yeah, it, it, it always changes. Well, yeah. And that's sort of, like I said, that's the attraction to this world for me. I mean, I want to, I mean, the other thing that I've, that I know you've hit on on this podcast and I think is true is there's this wonderful family of people I mean, you know, sure, occasionally there's people who butt heads or get into out-and-out fights or arguments, but there's a wonderful community of people in off-road, you know. Very true. It's it's irreplaceable. It's like having a huge family in many ways. And between that and the fact that you get to go out and, like, see things that you've never seen before – And maybe not a lot of other people have seen either between all of these sort of like innate competitions, you know, even if they're just competitions with yourself, it's really an awesome place to be. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. absolutely. There's all these challenges and opportunities to learn and get chances to get to see things and meet wonderful people. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Exactly. We, uh, when we travel, if we're not in our semi truck slash toy hauler, um, right? What, do you, what, the, what is it the called? Taj the Taj hauler. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> if we're not in that, and we're driving the Jeep or the or the Raptor with the adventure trailer, we we try to avoid interstates. Uh-huh. So last yeah. year when we left, um, we got done with the Rebel Rally. We were here in Arizona. We did, um, you know, there was no SEMA. So we did the Arizona Peace Trail, and then yep. and then we went to Apache Junction on the way home, mm-hmm. or the way to Texas. Um, right. We went um, there and then took all dirt roads from there to El Paso. Oh, that's awesome. You know, there was a little bit of paved roads here and there, but right. basically it was all dirt roads all the way down to the border, and then right. across the border, around all, you know, as far as we could go to El Paso. And then at that point, it was like, okay, we got to be where we need to be in two days. We just got to get it done. Right, right. But we yeah. just did the same thing from Minneapolis to Vegas. Mm-hmm. We, wow, that's that's a real long stretch. Well, it wasn't, we didn't go off-road uh-huh. per se, because we only had six days. We had to, we right, had to right, go from sure. Minneapolis to Vegas for the beginning of the Rebel so mm-hmm. we we took all back roads, but uh-huh. they were mostly paved. I mean, we got onto some dirt roads and and uh, went to a lot of national parks, uh, monuments, some of the old forts, um, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And 
and just had a great time. But we didn't hit the interstate until we got to Grand Junction. And then uh-huh. from there, we just took the 17, then the 15, and on into to Vegas. But the, Well, sure. Uh, Nobody wants to drive on back roads through Utah. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I've done all those roads before. No, I know. I mean, we even did, uh, before we got the magazine, we did that first dirt and drive with Payway. Oh, yeah. And awesome. uh, we when we the only road I hadn't been on was the the road coming out of Mesquite up to the uh, up into Utah that back trail there, but all the stuff across um, that um, oh what do they call it um, that northern area of Arizona um, oh yeah the, know, the the Arizona Strip yeah the Strip I'd done a yeah. lot of those roads because I'd lived in Cedar City and we used to go right. down there all the time in the nineties right so right, you know. Right. Huh. Yeah. And I still love that area, but oh yeah, it's, it's uh, we were in a hurry at that point because we'd taken yeah. so much time to go the rest of it. But we stopped in I know little small paradigm. towns and talked to people, and you know, yeah. try to find the little homely, you know, the home restaurant that you know only the locals yes. know because everybody you're else driving blows through by some them. little town and there's a guest or a, a, a restaurant and there's a bunch of like farm trucks and other cars parked outside, yep. and you know that's the place to eat because it's good. Yeah, and you walk in, everybody looks at you like. Right. Who are the aliens? The, the, you know? the, the record scratches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Those are that's that's the spice of life. But yeah, I mean, I don't know, like just the like I said, the people are wonderful. I mean uh, all these events too are fascinating. Like the Rebel Rally sounds awesome. I've never participated in it in any kind of extent. And and that's another kind of like if you ask what I want to do, what I want to do is is go to more of these sort of varied events that I haven't been to, different places to go four wheeling. Well, we but start, I also we the problem start. is I also want to keep doing uh, you know Ultimate Adventure and right the the Go Devil Run the thing that Ian started. Mm-hmm. Although Trent and I were uh, helped him out with uh, running the route at least we we pre ran it together. I don't remember whether he talked about that in his. Um, podcast with you, but Trent and I kind of helped him figure out where a good place to go play would be. But that's that's one of the best times that I've had with clothes on. That <laughs> GDR is just amazing, and I don't know why because it's. I mean, I love flat fenders, like little old Jeeps are rad, but they break down constantly, and it's like it doesn't matter because you're you know it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and you're prepared for it. But yeah, and simple. then when when you fix the f- one of the five things that goes wrong with them, then you keep going. Exactly. So one of the other five things breaks. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I want to do. Is is I used I had a a 48 at one time, but uh-huh. it had a a little V V8 Buick. Well, uh-huh. what's the, what it's the 215 or the 3.8. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the yep that that famous little Buick V8. That's, yep. that's a really cool swap. It was a it was a screaming little car, great uh-huh. in the sand dunes, and in uh, I bought it when I was in uh, Cedar City, and we used to take it down to what is now called Sand Hollow. At okay, that yep. point, there was no lake out there, there was no homes, golf course, none of that. It was all just wild right. strip area, and uh, we uh-huh. used to go down to the sand dunes there or Pink Coral, and that little flat fender with 32-inch, 33-inch, BFG all yeah. terrains would just scream in the sand dunes. Yeah. No cage, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. a little B yeah. pillar hoop, you know, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, Ian gives me a hard time. I put a roll bar in mine because I just about killed myself on an obstacle that I've driven up 15 different, 20, 30 different times. <laughs> uh, and uh, I realized why roll bars were in those Jeeps. And I know it. I, I, I totally agree that they don't look as good with a roll bar in there, but I'm not jumping out of a flat fender when it starts going over. Yeah. I realized that as I was going over in a flat fender without a roll bar. <laughs> yeah, me, because of where the seat is located and how big the steering wheel is, Yeah, it's no, like I'm, I'm built it in anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm not jumping out of that. It's just not happening. Right. And I, I, I think a lot of people who think they are, may not know what they're talking about <laughs> exactly but uh uh that's really neither here nor there i i fully support people who put roll bars in their old flat fenders but i do agree that they do look awfully rad with the windshield down and no roll bar yep safety third anyway you know right yeah 
Well, you look a lot cooler on a motorcycle without leathers and the helmet, but. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, it's been an, it's been a charmed life. I like, uh, I listened to the last two of your podcasts that I listened to were, uh, Pat Grimillion, which I was, right. uh, really enjoyed. He, he did come up to me in Moab a few years ago and say, he talked, he was talking to me and he was like, yeah, burn. And I was like, he knows who I am. And I was just like, so even though he was giving himself a hard time for not remembering people's names, I was totally flattered that he knew who the hell I was. It's, it's always awesome when that happens. You yeah. don't, you don't expect it. Um, I never expect it, but yeah. it's, uh, it's pretty cool when people come up and how many people now come up and go, Oh yeah, I listened to your podcast and that's right. all that they know me from. And it's, yeah, like, yeah. Right. That's refreshing. Cause that means I'm reaching right. new people. So it's cool. I similarly like people, I'll meet people and they'll be like, I'll tell them what I do. And they're like, Oh, have you ever heard of dirt every day? And it's like, yeah, I've heard of dirt every day. I've been on dirt every day a couple of times. And, and then it was like, Oh, so you know, Fred. And it's like, yeah, not only do I know Fred, but uh, <laughs> I technically started in this industry a little bit before he did. I think <laughs> maybe not with the same level of success, but uh, uh, that's not really, I, I, I wish Fred the most success and luck that he can he's he knows what he's doing he's doing a great job right Absolutely. and uh dave Chappelle's an absolutely wonderful human being and uh i wish him the utmost success with dirt every day those guys are killing it and they're having fun doing it too like i said i've been able to play with them on a few other shows you know if you can't Whether, have fun doing what you do yeah you need There's to something find wrong something with you. else to do that's Correct. right. That's right. Yep. That's right. Well, yeah. I, Vern, I want to say thank you for coming on board and sharing your life. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that you reached out and, and said that you had listened to some, you were on my list. There's a bunch of uh, media people that are on my list. I started off when we, when I decided to do this, my wife uh -huh. was like, okay, you got it for like, four years, you know, you got to do a podcast, you got to do a podcast, you right. got to write your story, you know, a biography, something. And I'm like, eh, right, no, right. I don't want to do that. And then finally COVID came and I was sitting in our hotel that we have in Texas with nobody else in it. And we're like, okay, I got to do something. Cause I'm stuck here right. now for the next two months at least. And, uh, so that's what we did. I, I, I started the podcast and she goes, well, all right, write down a list of 50 names. Right. And at first it was like, okay, you know, it was kind of hard to do that. And now my list is probably 400 names long. Right. And, right. you know, I get a lot I of... I can see how that could grow. Yeah, I get a lot of emails, uh, a lot of messages, texts, and Facebook messages yeah. and stuff saying, hey, you should do this. Or somebody like yourself reaches out and says, hey, I really like what you're doing. And then I look on the yeah. list and go, ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Now I know him. <laughs> well, I'm totally preaching to the choir, but uh, I think you're doing an amazing job. It's really, it's like a, like like I told you. I mean, I heard about it, and people people that I know and trust were like, "You, you should listen to this. It's really good." And I was, I, but I just didn't get it. And so, what I'd like to say now is that people should listen to this podcast. But of course, they're not going to listen to it unless they already do. And right. Then, the, they need then to they'll tell hear their me friends. say it. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. No, but I really, I, I really thank you for the, the chance to be on here. I'm flattered. Um, it's humbling to be, have done this, been in this industry for 20 years. That still blows my mind um, or more than 20 years now. And uh, I also wanted to say, so thank you very much for what you do. I mean, I, I, I know it's not, I'm sure it's not always easy and uh, I really appreciate it. It's, a lot of fun to get to learn more about people, well, people that we feel like we know. And um, I also want to come visit the hotel in Mason if you still have it. And oh, absolutely. That's, that that's be a the good one reason investment to go back we're to, probably never going to get rid of. <laughs> good. It will give me a reason to go back to Katempsi, which is, we were just out there for Ultimate Adventure, and yep. I think that's one of my new favorite places on Earth to go for. I mean, that place is rad. Yeah, the Taj Mahaler was parked there. <laughs> 
Oh, was it? Yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, I think I did see it. It was along yeah, the okay. fence line there in the campground. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Fred was yeah. supposed to put a sticker on it. He probably did. <laughs> Fred works in mysterious ways. I haven't been back to it since we left it, but uh, after the end of the season. But we'll be there after SEMA and uh, oh, be back. I just thought of... I thought of something that's a, that would maybe make for a good story. Sure. You were talking about like stories about other people in the industry. Um, I, I know you wanted to call this to an end, but let me no, get no, this no, story no, no, out. No. It's love really stories, funny. love stories. So, uh, Trent McGee. So as uh, Trent, he's probably my best buddy. He and I, uh, didn't really cross paths at the magazine, but I knew who he was when I was there. And then when I moved to Phoenix, I found out that he was in Phoenix and he's like five miles down the road. So we're constantly doing things together from like helping each other with house projects or whatever, or, you know, maybe cracking a beer or two in the shop every now and again, or building UA vehicles together, which is another fun thing that I get to do. But one night in Moab. Oh, and a lot of know, stories have started that way. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. I think we might've been at the brewery, but and we were surely with a bunch of other people, but for some reason, all I remember, it was me and him. And we walked, we were walking back to our hotel, which wasn't the La Quinta, but the one that's uh, just north from there, that's sort of been there longer. I couldn't tell you what the name of it is. And it's probably changed two or three times over the past five years. Anyways, we were walking through the parking lot of the La Quinta and, um, Sitting there was Fred Williams, uh, FC, whatever that blue military FC thing is that he has. I should, as a Jeep guy, I should know what the, the, the call out is, but I don't know what it is. It's a military FC four door okay. with a, it's got some weird like three cylinder turbo power, or supercharged diesel. I don't know what it is. It's some really weird engine in it and it was sitting in the parking lot. And Trent and I might have had a few beers. I'm not going to tell you any lies. <laughs> like, we weren't just drinking iced tea. Um, and uh, so it was sitting there. It was safe. You know, nobody was going to mess with it. But the doors were unlocked. And we knew it was Fred's. And we knew Fred was staying in a room up there. And we knew Fred went to bed as the sun set. Because that's sort of what he does often. And uh, so... We jumped in there and we're sitting there and pretending to drive it and da 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 da. And, and I look down and I look at the ignition switch, and it's like one of these aftermarket ignition switches. And I have the same one in my 1949 CJ3A. And I said that ignition switch, once it gets to be a year old, if you have a key that will go in it, it will start it. <laughs> and that key. And I shouldn't be telling people this because they can, it'll make it very easy to steal lots of vehicles, although not many vehicles have that ignition switch. If you have a key from a master lock or one of those series of master locks, it'll go right in that ignition switch. And like I said, it doesn't need the teeth on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I stick it in there. I stick this key that I've got that I probably was the key to my, my other flat fender, and I start the thing up. Vroom. And we took a video and sent it to Fred that night. So at any rate, I, it fired right up and I, and we shot a video of it on our iPhones. And then we sent that to Fred as he was asleep in his bed upstairs. <laughs> and, uh, and then we got out of that and Ned Bacon's flat fender was there and it was parked in the spot. And being the continued comedians that we think we are, we popped it in a neutral and pushed it out and turned it around and, put it right back in the same parking space aiming the other direction perfect <laughs> <laughs> and apparently ned was pretty hot when he saw that he was like who was messing with my car <laughs> and then it was like it's okay ned it was us <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome though i and love those I kind of pranks fr i think fred knew so yeah i'm i'm all for pranks as long as they're relatively harmless as these were awesome all right. Well, I'll make sure that that's in the uh, that uh, that's in the, the podcast for sure. Right. So well, anyway, sorry. sorry um, to... No, no, don't be sorry. We love <laughs> the stories. So thank you very much for coming on board, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk again for sure. We'll get together. 
yeah, sure. Like I said, next time you're in Phoenix, let me know. We'll grab grab lunch or something like that. And I really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for your work. All right, Vern. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a rating. Share some feedback with us via Facebook or Instagram and share our link among your friends who might be like-minded. Well, that brings this episode to an end. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week with Conversations with Big Rich. Thank you very much.